welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, it is rich uh, time again and today we are going to pray for a very special nation of Malawi. Uh, Malawi is a South um, East African country uh, bordered by Zambia, Republic, uh, United Republic of Tanzania, and Mozambique. Uh, it is a narrow and uh, landlocked country uh, with a long uh, border with Lake uh, Malawi, which is also known as um, Lake Nyasa. Um, about 20% of the land of Malawi is surrounded by, by, by this lake. So, yeah. Okay, the capital city of Malawi is Longwe and the population size is about 21 million people, uh, majority of whom are Christians. We have also uh, nine every nation churches there, including two church plants. Um, now, how can you pray for Malawi? Well, uh, there is a lot we can pray for, but uh, we'll try to focus on a few points for now. Uh, definitely believing uh, that God is able to do abundantly, more abundantly, exceeding beyond what uh, we can ask or think through this uh, prayer session. All right, so let us pray. Um, as we pray, we are going to pray for the following points. Um, number one, we want to pray for more laborers uh, as the harvest is plentiful in this country of Malawi. And uh, we are also going to pray for a strong discipleship culture in the new Every Nation Church plants. Um, we also would like to pray for Bibles and uh, theological instructions for under-resourced believers. And finally, we would like to pray for the light of Christ to liberate those held captive by witchcraft and Islam. So let us pray together. Join me to pray for this nation of Malawi. Father God, we just want to thank you for this very, very, very special nation of Malawi, God. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that you are that Lord of the harvest, Lord God. And uh, for that, we just want to ask you, Lord God, that you will send laborers, Lord God, to the mission fields of Malawi, Father God. And uh, we just want to thank you, Lord God, that you will send very capable uh, laborers, oh God, missionaries of God, Father God, that are full of your spirit, oh God, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father God. Thank you especially also, Lord, for the senders, oh God, those who will contribute uh, monetary, God, Father God, financial, oh God, just to, to empower this mission field in the name of Jesus that you, you will just raise so many people, you will put so strong desire for many just to contribute in whatever capacity they can, Lord God, to empower this important mission, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Father, we just want also to pray, particularly for uh, Pastor James and uh, Grace, um, uh, Pastor James and uh, Grace, uh, who are leading the mission, Every Nation mission in this nation. Uh, we just want to declare a special grace upon this special family of Pastor James and Grace Seyama, who have planted so many churches uh, in this country of Malawi. Uh, Pastor James, we bless you. We bless your family. We bless the churches that have been planted. Father, we thank you that this church are, are productive, oh God, Father. Thank you, God, Father, that these churches are multiplying, oh God, Father, God. Thank you that these are the churches that are demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit, of oh God, reaching out to every corner of Malawi in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much. We bless you, Lord God. We thank you. Yes, Lord. Yes. Let's pray for the next prayer point, which was um, 
to, to pray for a strong discipleship culture in the new Every Nation Church uh, plans. So Father God, we just want to bless you again. We just want to thank you for, 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 for the teams that are discipling uh, this nation of Malawi, Lord God. Thank you, Father God, for a strong uh, discipleship culture, oh God, Father. Thank you for teachable hearts, oh God. The disciples that are already uh, being discipled currently, Father, we pray that they will be so teachable. There will be men and women who are full of obedience, oh God, who are keen to learn, oh God to learn more about you, to, to, to become intimate with you, O oh God, so they can be effective, O oh God, so they can demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit of Father God. In the name of Jesus, we bless this discipleship mission, O oh God, in Malawi, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that that, that, that biblical truth, O oh God, Father, will prevail in Malawi, in the name of Jesus, that your word will go out are uh, undiluted, O oh God, Father, in the name of Jesus. There will be a pure word coming from your spirit, undiluted, O oh God, touching this nation of Namibia, uh, of, of, of Malawi, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, uh, let's pray for the next prayer point, uh, which is the resources that are needed by believers. So we are going to pray for Bibles and uh, theological instruction material for under-resourced believers. Uh, so, Father, we thank you again uh, for, for, for your church in Malawi, oh God, Father God, that, that there will be resources, oh God, Father, to, 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 for, for the believers, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We, we, we thank you, oh God, Father God, that um, you are raising, oh God, Father, really kingdom finances, oh God, who are able to supply Bibles, oh God, to this nation of Malawi, oh God, especially into our mission fields in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you, oh God, Father, that you'll also empower the church um, in Malawi, uh, every nation church in Malawi, with even digital resources in the name of Jesus. So because your word say, oh God, Father, in the last days, in these days, um, your knowledge shall fill the earth as water covers the sea. So, Father, we want that knowledge to cover the whole nation of Malawi uh, with your knowledge. So, thank you for sending resources, oh God, Father, to this nation. Thank you, oh God, Father, that really everyone uh, who is willing will really get access to, 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 to online resources, oh God, YouTube and other social media where God, where, where your word is, is coming through daily uh, from different sources, Father. We thank you so much, Lord God. We thank you, oh God, that your knowledge is indeed filling uh, the nation of Malawi. The knowledge of the glory of the Father is filling this nation of Malawi in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you so much. So let's pray now for the last prayer point. Okay. Uh, Let's pray for the light of Christ to liberate those who are held captive by witchcraft and Islam in the nation of Malawi. Father, we thank you for the nation of Malawi once again in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father God, that uh, your church in Malawi is built upon the rock who is Jesus Christ, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against this church. Thank you, Father God, that your church is prevailing uh, against false religions and all manners of witchcraft in this nation in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you are uniting the Church of Christ in Malawi, O oh God, Father, that will be able really to fight this war, O oh God, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for giving them strategy, O oh God, how to defeat every enemy of lie, O oh God, Father, and false religions, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, including false gods, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your light of truth, O oh God, that is shining through this nation to bring freedom to the captives, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, O oh God, Father, that the captives have been set free in Malawi through your word, through evangelism, through discipleship, in the name of Jesus. Father, we just want to thank you that, that the name of Jesus is, will be exalted in Malawi, that every knee, every knee of witchcraft, every knee of false religion and false God will bow to the glory of the Father in the name of Jesus. And every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much that the nation of Malawi is blessed 
the churches, uh, every nation churches and mission in Malawi are blessed and they are prospering in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much. We bless the nation of Malawi in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to our online platform. It's a wonderful blessing to be together once again. If you're here for the very first time, please do subscribe and like this channel. We want to encourage you to also send it on to family and friends. We believe that these words are going to transform lives, and we've heard testimonies about that already. And if you're here for the first time, you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, at the end of this uh, video, we are going to uh, give you an opportunity and lead you in prayer so that you can receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we'll also share some prophetic senses that we're getting as we preach this message. I'm going to pray for us. We're in our series this week again called Set Apart Wealth and Finances, a tremendous series that's going to be life transforming. And uh, we've already begun uh, receiving many testimonies about how this truth is beginning to set people free and begin to bear fruit in their lives. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll do our introduction. So Father, we thank you, Lord God, so much that we have the privilege of being transformed by your word, Lord, that we are not uh, doomed to be uh, stuck in the lie, to be deceived, but that we have the opportunity to have the truth in our lives, setting us free. And we thank you, Lord, that today, as we listen to these words, you, you are going to liberate our hearts, Lord, and set us free into your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so um, we've been preaching now for this is the third week we've been preaching for the last two weeks. The first week we, we touched on who you worship and how you can't worship two masters. You have to choose between God and money and how money actually competes for worship with God. And it's important that we make that decision. And then last week we spoke about how God is a wealthy king. And how if we are his offspring, we are his children, the implications of being children and, and being in a family of a wealthy king are massive. And we saw that from last week's message. All of these messages are on the YouTube channel. You can go back and get them. Today we're going to talk about the mindset of stewardship. And, and uh, uh, we're going to touch on personal and national implications of having that mindset of stewardship. Next week we'll talk about blessings and miracles, and then the week after that, we'll touch on financial bondages and generational poverty. After that, we'll do two weeks of honoring God, talking about how important work is, giving, tithing, offering seeds, etc. And then the following week after that, we'll deal with family finance, God's way. We'll give you very practical information as to how to structure your, your family finances and, and build wealth. And then the, next, the ninth week, we'll talk about warnings on wealth and riches so that we're able to temper the message with regards to the warnings that the Word of God gives us uh, uh, in uh, pertaining to wealth and riches. And then the tenth week, we'll talk about how to pray for finances. Awesome. So today we're going to deal with the mindset of stewardship. We started off speaking about how you have to choose who you're going to worship. You can't worship money and God. You can't serve money and God. You have to serve God, use money as a steward. And so the uh, last week we spoke about how God is a wealthy king. His creation reflects wealth and opulence and and. Um, and splendor and majesty. And uh, so today we'll go a little bit further into that. And when we're talking about um, the mindset of stewardship, stewardship is management. That God is giving us something that we ought to manage well, take care of, that we are stewards. As much as the word does uh, give an indication of ownership, uh, it is an ownership which is delegated with accountability, meaning that, yes, we have so many things that are ours in the natural sense, but we have a spiritual accountability for everything that is ours, including our bodies, including our souls. And so let me not get ahead of myself, but the first principle is this, that God gave mankind dominion and rulership and stewardship. And we see this from the word of God, even from the beginning, this principle of mankind being a steward, that man is a manager of resources, that man is a steward of that which God has made. And we saw last week in the scripture 
Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. And then we saw in, in the Psalms as well that the, the, the heavens are the Lord's and the earth he has given to the sons of mankind. And so we're looking here at this principle that God gave mankind dominion and rulership and stewardship. Looking at Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, obviously a very fundamental scripture in terms of the purpose of man and, and the design of man. It says here in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Very important terminology. That mankind is not made in the in image of the monkey or the animal or the bull or the goat. He is made in the image of God Almighty. For what purpose? Because he is to reflect the regency. He is to reflect the glory and the dominion and the majesty of his father. That is why he has to be like him in, and made in the image and likeness of God. If God didn't want us to reflect him in his personhood in the earth, then he would have made us in the image of something else. But because he wanted an offspring that was going to reflect him, he made us in his image and in his likeness. It says, and then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And by the way, this is at the end of the creation order. Man is made on the sixth day. And so all things have been made and prepared as a residence for mankind and the expression of mankind's dominion and as a, a, a domicile for God and man to, to relate in a very special relationship. That mankind is being introduced, is being invited into this love relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. And so it says, let us then make man in our image after our likeness. And let them, look at the words here, let them have dominion. What is dominion? Dominion means to exert authority. Dominion is rulership. And God says, and remember, God is speaking as a king. Where the word of the king is, there is power. There is law established. And so this is the decree of God. Let mankind have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Awesome. It means let mankind rule the entire thing with all that is in it. We saw from Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. And now we see here that he has delegated this under the dominion of mankind. And this is why when many ask, why is the earth in the condition that it is? Why is there suffering? Why is there pain? It's because God gave it to mankind and mankind ruined it. And so there was supposed to be an excellence in the management and stewardship of mankind that was going to bring about eternal and perpetual prosperity upon the earth. If you consider how people say, no, but poverty is a reality and all of that, it wasn't God's design from the onset. There was no poverty in the earth that God designed. He said it was good, it was good, it was good. And when he made man, it said it was very good. But when Satan entered in and sin entered in and deception entered in, then destruction and death also followed. And poverty is part of that. Sickness is part of that. This is why when we say, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we are pleading and crying for a heavenly reality where there is no sin, no death, no poverty, no lack, no destruction. And we are praying for that to come on the earth. And that is God's design even in the end. And so we see that God has delegated the whole earth, the whole planet to mankind. And in this instance here, there was no distinction because obviously he was giving it to the, to the family of Adam. But there was no distinction as to whether it's the Christian or the non-Christian. Because at that time, men had not yet fallen from grace. He had not fallen from glory. And so in this instance, the whole earth was supposed to be for the children of mankind. And then it says in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. 
And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Awesome. It's amazing that the word of God, that the scriptures would introduce even females at this instance when speaking about authority and dominion and the likeness of, 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 of mankind in the image of God. This is such a redemptive passage with regards to woman because God is looking at mankind as a whole, the husband and the wife and then the children out of that, that Adam's family are supposed to be rulers, that they are supposed to have dominion, that they are supposed to reflect the righteous king of heaven and rule in that righteous way in the earth. So we're talking about the principle that God gave mankind dominion and rulership and stewardship. Okay, so we continue here. It goes on to verse 28 and it says, And God blessed them. And God blessed them. God didn't curse them. God blessed them. Blessing is an empowerment to prosper. Through the decrees and the words of God, he spoke over them. And look at the blessing. This is what it says. And God said to them. So blessing is an empowerment to prosper by means of speech. And God said to them, in the, in the way that, uh, I'm just interrupting myself here, in the way that a curse is a disempowerment to prosper, or a, a, a curse is an interruption of, of prosperity by means of words. And so God said to them, in blessing them, be fruitful, be productive, be fruitful, be productive, and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it have dominion subdue it enforce your rule over it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the uh, over every living thing that moves on the earth and so god is blessing them and this blessing sounds like a commission like a mandate like a command saying to them you are now rulers in the earth have dominion rule. You are stewards. You are managers over the entire planet. Take care of it. Cultivate it. Produce out of it. Multiply. And so this is awesome. It gives us a clear instruction that from the beginning, this was God's identity for mankind. That mankind was not supposed to be a slave to his environment. Mankind was not supposed to be a victim of the weather, a victim of the environment, a victim of what was going on around him. But that on the inside, he had the character and nature of God and he was supposed to express that in rulership and take care of the wealth of the earth and steward the wealth and the riches that God had invested into the planet and that the kingdom on earth was supposed to be a reflection of the kingdom in heaven, hallelujah. And so we see this is God's design. And the question is, will it prevail? Because it is God's plan. But we understand from the word of God that not everything that God wants comes to pass. Not everything that is God's will comes to pass. This is why we pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because on earth your will is not being done. Hallelujah. And so we see very clearly that God gave mankind dominion and rulership and stewardship. All right, then number two, God's royal family are producers and custodians of the family wealth. Now, why are we saying this? We are saying this because now that you are redeemed in Christ, you are born again. You have been restored in your right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. You have received the kingdom of God as an inheritance. That the earth that was given to Abraham is also part of your inheritance. That wherever you go, you are a dominion entrenched spirit you are a spirit that rules by god's mandate he has given authority to his son jesus christ and he's commissioned us over the nations to say go and make disciples teach them train them raise them bring them out of darkness into light bring them into the truth Bring them out of the destruction of the enemy. For the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we may have life and life to the full. 
And so we see here that God's royal family are producers. We're going to look at the scripture now to show you that your identity is not just a church member. Your identity is not just a religious person. You are a regent. You are a king. You are the, the child of a king. You are a prince. And with it, you have a mandate. You have a mandate. That dominion mandate that was given in the beginning has not been canceled out because God is still not ruling the earth himself. He is still operating in stewardship over the planet through the delegated authority of mankind. And so we see that God's royal family are producers and custodians of family wealth. We see this because this is like hailing from the the previous message that we preached last week that God is a king and the Bible clearly teaches that we are his children. He came to his own, his own did not receive him, but to everyone who received him, he gave them power to become children of God. Jesus said, you must be born of God. You must be born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. We are his children. We are his offspring. We are God's children. Not everyone is God's children because not everyone wants to receive Jesus. But to all who receive them, they, they get the right. They are authorized children of God. And so what does that mean? It means that we get to exercise the mandate of the Father. And we must begin to tailor our identity and our, our responsibility in life in accordance with that revelation that we are children of God. We are not just citizens of a national nation on the earth, but we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. Let me read for us here. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, as Peter gives this revelation. It says, but you are a chosen race. He's speaking to the church, to the believers, you and I that believe in Christ. You are a chosen race. Another version says a chosen generation. This is speaking of a kind of man. When the Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new creature. He's a new race. He's a type of man. And we know that and we've taught it before that there's only one kind of race and it's the human race. But now because of the new creation, because of the born again experience, the born again man is a new race. There's no racism between color of, of white and black and, and brown and all. There's no such thing as many races. There's one race of one blood from two parents, Adam and Eve. But for them that are born again, they are born out of the grave. They are out of, or out of death. They are born again. And they are in the similitude of the second Adam, not the first one. This is why the Bible calls us that we are a different race from different tribes and nations and peoples and kindreds and, and, and colors. But we are a different race by our nature. We have a righteous nature. We have the nature of God. And so you are a chosen race. Then he continues, a royal priesthood. You are a king priest. You are a royal priesthood. Oh, please believe this. If, if the church can just begin to adopt this identity and begin to walk in its reality, it will stop with its delinquent behavior because there is a certain culture and conduct that goes with being royalty, with being royal priests. The royalty relates to our rulership and authority even over devils. And then our priesthood relates to our service in the temple of God, in the, in the presence of God, our access that we have with the Heavenly Father and our intercession that we are performing between God and man in our ministry of reconciliation. We are priests. And yet there are many believers that are not living in this confidently. And he says, you are a chosen race, you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation, you are a holy tribe. Many, many believers still identify themselves much more with their natural, nat, nat, natural and national genealogy. I'm from this tribe, I'm from that tribe, I'm from this uh, family, I'm from that family. And they forfeit the benefits of being part of the holy nation of Jesus Christ, where God the Father is the father of that nation. 
The Bible says that we have a citizenship in heaven. These are realities. These are not just metaphoric and, and, and philosophical terms. These are truths because we are actually born in a real kingdom. There is a real king with a real territory. The, the Bible says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever. So Jesus is a true king and we are part of his family. The word of God says that we are a chosen race. It says that I am a royal priesthood and so I will live like that. I am a chosen generation. I will live like that. I am a holy nation. And then it says a people for his own possession. A people for, who, who, who belong to God. Who are God's people. That you may look at the reason... Why did he make us to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation for his own possession? Why? So that we may proclaim or exhibit or reveal the excellencies or the virtues, the beauties, the glories of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh man, we can preach just this verse for a month to extrapolate the detailed revelation that the believer ought to be walking in. The believer is not supposed to be tossed to and fro with every kind of wind of doctrine and just be managing sin management and don't do this and don't do that. No, there is a time when you mature out of that and you begin to live in the maturity of the sons of God, the mature sons of God who are in charge of God's kingdom. This is true. That we are beyond begging and asking and pleading and ploying, but we are exercising authority because all things are, are yours in Christ. Let's continue. So we're talking here about how God's royal family are producers. We said it before that the mandate from, from Genesis is that we should be fruitful and multiply. This is to our Father's glory, Jesus said, that you are fruitful, that you bear much fruit. That the family of God is supposed to be productive. You know, we're going to talk about honoring God through work. But let me just say this now. That many people have this idea that work is about trying to make a living. No. When it comes to royal families, work is about producing something amazing. The same way that God looked at his creation and said it's very good. Because there's purpose and destiny behind the work. In the same way, God is getting us to a place as his children where our work is beyond just the 9 to 5 or the business time that we're spending, but that there is a destiny calling behind our work, that we work. And, and sometimes we, we look at people that are wealthy and we say, why is he still working? He's, a, he's already got all the money in his. Why doesn't he just go to a certain island and relax and enjoy his money? Because royal families understand that work is not just about eating and drinking and shelter. It is about an agenda. It is a wealth agenda of the family in dominion. All right, so we continue here. It says that uh, we're saying that God's royal family are, are producers and custodians of family wealth. Okay, now let me uh, read us another scripture that will uh, explain to us how we are kings and priests. It says here in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, and they sang a new song. This is a heavenly vision that John had. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you, speaking of Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. Okay, you were crucified. And by your blood, you ransomed men, you ransomed people, you purchased men for God. By the blood of Christ, Jesus purchased us, bought us, hallelujah, set us free, and bought our freedom. And then it says that we are ransomed for God from every tribe, whether in Africa, whether in Australia, whether in Europe, whether in America, whether in Asia, it doesn't matter. From every tribe, he has purchased men from every tribe and language and people and nation, every family, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Look at that destiny statement that God has purchased sons and daughters out of darkness into the light, 
and now he, he has made them. It says, verse 10, and you have made them a kingdom. The better construction is to say, you have made them to be kings and priests to our God. We are king priests on behalf of God. And they look at the emphasis. He continues on, not only to say we are king priests, but he actually expresses the answers, and they shall reign. Where? On the earth. They shall rule. Where? On the earth. They shall rule in the earth. Pastor Chris, are you saying that we will rule now? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. This is already taking place. Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Therefore go. He delegated authority to us. Is it to rule and to be bossy over nations? No. We have a different family. We are king priests. We are servant kings. We are ruling because the kingdom of God is expanding. We rule by our decrees. We rule by the gospel that we bring. We rule by the transformation that we bring in the lives of men and women. Hallelujah. We rule over sickness and disease. We rule over devils and demons. We rule over dysfunctions and destruction in family. We rule over them. We set captives free. We are like Jesus Christ. As he is, so are we in this world. That we are, we are the kings over which he is king. And whoever comes in our presence must become acquainted with the kingdom that we represent. The Bible says that we are like ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Now, having a ministry of reconciliation, that we are reconciling lost sons and daughters back to God. We are ruling kings and priests. Hallelujah. All right, let's look here at Acts chapter 20. This is where the Apostle Paul is explaining also a certain work ethic because we've said in this principle that God's royal family are producers and custodians of family wealth. And we are speaking obviously very broadly about our role as king priests, but particularly in regards to wealth, it goes without saying that there are resources of the kingdom that we are administrating in, in order to exercise the mandate that the Father has given us. No king, the, the Bible says, no soldier goes to war and pays for his own, his own uh, trip to war and his weapon and his uniform. The government pays for that. In the same way, we are exercising the mandate of the Father and we are sponsored by the kingdom of God to do it. Royal families have a budget, hallelujah. <laughs> we have provisions from God. May somebody believe this, catch this, and live it out and begin to demonstrate the dominion of God in the earth, in the deliverance that comes in many instances when we take the wealth of the kingdom and begin to change lives around us. And so let's look here at Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul speaking. Uh, and, and this man lived with such a sense of royalty at the revelation of who he was and it didn't faze him whether he had uh, enough resource or not or whether it was taken by the circumstances that he had because of the ministry that he was willing to take he said i gave up all things it's not that uh, paul couldn't be wealthy he said he gave it up particularly this is awesome this is wealth men mentality that he has access to the resources my god shall supply all your needs he's the one who wrote that according to your riches and glory according to his riches in glory. And so the Apostle Paul says this, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities, met my needs, and to those who were with me. And so he's saying these hands of his, with these hands, he produced what was necessary to meet the needs of himself and those who were with him. Look at his mindset. That he's not just meeting the needs of himself. You guys take care of yourself. Mm -mm. He has this royalty mentality. This stewardship mentality. That says I am going to not only produce. Because I have the ability. I will produce for myself. But also with, for those who were with me. Verse 35. In all things. In all things. In all things. I have shown you. That by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord. So by working hard, we're going to talk about this when we are in week six or seven, talking about honoring God with your work. 
by working hard. There is something about hard work that brings out the best in us. By working hard in this way, we must help the weak. That there is this idea that our work in the kingdom is not just for ourselves. Oh, my food, my drink, my clothes, no. It is so that we can help the weak. Why? Because our nature is that of helping. We are saviors that are coming from Zion. That we are rising up from the kingdom of God as those who bring deliverance and help from on high. And so blessed be any nation where we are planted. Blessed be any family where we are planted. Blessed be any community where we are planted. Why? Because of the access that we have. Why? Because of who we are. Hallelujah. And so he says, I've showed you in all things, by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he himself said, now mark this, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, for many people, they look at that statement and say, no way. <laughs> I'd rather be on the receiving side. Give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. They'd rather be on the side of, of receiving. And this is, this is typical of this generation that are full of socialists. That just feel like, I don't want to do anything. Let the government just give me, give me, give me. No one owes you anything. And God has created you and crafted you. To, and enabled you to be able to produce. And this is in royal families, as much as there's access, many times the children in that royal family must still go for training so that they rise up with some certain kind of skill. And they work not because they have to, but because work is a holy and redeemed calling. It's an eternal calling. We will work in the new creation. And so working hard, in order to exercise the resources of the kingdom, produce it, multiply it. God said to Adam, cultivate the garden. He gave him a job before he gave him a wife. He gave him a job before there was sin, before the fall. He gave him work to do. Make the, the earth fruitful, subdue it, cultivate it. Take the garden of Eden and expand it throughout the earth. Bring prosperity and order everywhere you go. Don't be slack. Don't allow things around you to begin to deteriorate and to be in chaos. But bring order. You are a king. And this is God's command to his children. This is why the children of God must not be lazy. They, not, they must not be slothful. They must be diligent. They must be the hardworking ones. They must be the effective ones. They should be the ones that are called upon to say, please come and solve this problem. Why? Because they come with the resources of the kingdom. It's not about the money you have. It's about the access that you have to the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, money is not an issue at all. At all. At all. We saw last week how Jesus multiplies bread at will. <laughs> how God rains bread from heaven for the, for the people of Israel. So money is not the issue. Please don't think money is, the, money is not the issue. It's about who you are. It's about your identity. It's about where your trust and faith is. It's about knowing what you have already. We're not preaching this to you and trying to give you money. No, we are trying to teach you who you are and the word of the king that is in your heart. Out of the word will come everything that you need. He has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the promises that we have. That by the promises we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. That through the promises we begin to live the divine life, the higher life. The life of kings and priests. It doesn't matter what kind of lack it seems we have here. We are coming out of that at will depending on what we know about what we have. David said it this way, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I cannot lack, the Lord is my shepherd. All right, and so Jesus said that, look, there is this mentality that people have that it is more blessed to receive than to give. No. And this is where it's so important that we change our mentality of stewardship. Begin to realize that God wants you to be like him. 
He is not there going around begging and asking. No. He is at the point of giving, giving, giving. Without any contradiction, Hebrew says, the lesser is blessed by the greater. That means that the one who blesses others is the greater one. You go out with people, you want to be the one to buy them food, to pay for the bill, to buy someone a house. You pay for the school fees. You pay for the, the, the victory training. You pay for them to attend the men's camp. You pay. Th this is the greater one. The greater one blesses others. Hallelujah. This is so important. And many people don't understand this. And, 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 and they begin to live a life that is not reflecting the nature of their father. The lesser is blessed by the greater. And it is important that we begin to hear, hear these truths. And when we begin to hear these truths, we will begin to live in them, believing them and living them. The Bible says that the whole earth is groaning in earnest expectation for the sons of God, the mature you was, the mature sons of God who get this, the ones who are like Jesus, for them to be manifested because the whole creation has been given over to corruption. But the sons of God will redeem them out. Hallelujah. All right. We continue on this principle that God's royal family are producers and custodians of the family wealth. I love this scripture that we're going to deal with now. It reinforces the principle. It says here in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 17, God speaking to the people of Israel as they're coming into the promised land where they had houses they did not build, vineyards they did not plant. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. And so then God warns them. He says, beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Beware, be careful that you don't say my in your heart. Even if you don't say it out loud, you think it. Don't think this. Don't even feel this. That my power and my own strength, the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power, ability to get wealth or to produce wealth or to create wealth. Why? That he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. What is the promise that God gave to Abraham? He will inherit the whole earth. And so the children of Abraham, of whom we also are because we are in Christ, are heirs of the promise, even the Gentiles. And we are also recipients of the Holy Spirit. That we receive everything, hallelujah, promised to Abraham. And so, he says here that there is a tendency for people to say, look, I built this wealth myself. And God is saying, no. When you're dealing with me as my child, as my representative, as my king priest, begin to have the right attitude and begin to give credit to God for the wealth and the empowerment that you have to create wealth. And when you have that, you will begin to take advantage. You will begin to exercise this power, this ability to create wealth. This is amazing that God will say words like this. That seem controversial, but there's no controversy about it if you consider the royalty aspect of our identity. That we are not just some beggarly group of people that were rescued from the dunghill. No, we used to be that. But now we are new creations in Christ. We are born of God. We are children of the Most High God. And we are exercising dominion once again, spiritually. And there are natural and physical implications. Hallelujah. So the principle is made that God's royal family are producers and custodians of the family wealth. We have received power to create wealth. So if you're out there, I just want to say this. If you're out there and you're struggling financially, God is saying to you, come unto me. I will give you, I give power. I give power. I give ability. I empower people to prosper. And the examples are many. You look at Solomon. You look at Job. You look at Abraham. Even Abraham said, no, keep your things. There was a king who wanted to give him, keep your things. I don't want anyone to say that they made Abraham wealthy. Why? Because Abraham's wealthy, wealth must come from God. Awesome.
Principle number three. So the first principle is this, that God gave mankind dominion and rulership and stewardship. Number two, God's royal family are producers and custodians of the family wealth. Please have this mentality. Adopt this identity. Number three, God wants to change the world through you, personally and nationally. We're looking here at James chapter 2, verse 15. He says this, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, by, in the same way faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. He's speaking about how faith has actions. And that our faith and our character and our relationship with God needs to be reflected in our good works. If you have no good works, maybe check if you have faith. But it makes a very particular example, which is very pertinent in the context of the community of the believers. And he says that there is an expectation that you put your money where your mouth is. That if you say, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, make it happen. Make it happen. Hallelujah. Make it happen. Pastor Chris, I don't even have enough for me and my family and what, what, what. We will preach to you the truth. The, the word of God speaks about this in the book of Corinthians, about how God will make grace abound to you so that you are self-sufficient and generous. Self-sufficient and generous. This is first, uh, uh, second uh, Corinthians chapter 8, 9 over there. He says, God makes, will make all grace abound to you. I want to ask that, that we'll put the scripture up. It is so important. God will make all grace abound unto you. So that in every situation, you may be self-sufficient and generous. Self-sufficient and generous. Self-sufficient and generous. <laughs> so this is very important. That, that we understand that God wants us to take care of our families, yes, but also to take care of others because of who we are. Don't just say, my brother, be well, be well fled, be, be strong. Mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have to give, which you usually have, give. Give. Let your faith, let your demonstration be active. God wants to change the world through you. So at a personal level, this is very simple. Look around your community. The Bible says do good, especially. We must not uh, neglect to do good, especially to the household of faith. That we will do good, especially to those who are children of God. Okay, then we continue on. Let's look at the national level. I'm just going to use the example here of, um, of uh, what's the man's name? Joseph. Joseph. So Joseph was a foreigner in Egypt. And there was a, a great plan that God had on his life. But he was going to deliver an entire nation financially. Imagine helping an entire nation financially. Financially. And it wasn't like he came from a wealthy family and that family is what helped them. Mm -mm. It was because of the wisdom and favor of God, the empowerment of God. And so what happened is Joseph's story is obviously amazing a narrative in Genesis 40, up here from 37 on to 41, 42. But we're just capturing it at the end as he gets instated as a viceroy, vice regent in Egypt. And so at this point, he's been persecuted, he's been deserted, he's been sold into slavery. It's just been a rough, rough, rough life for him. But he's been faithfully waiting for the plan of God to be fulfilled. All right. And so the, the Pharaoh has a dream. In the dream, he has these seven uh, scrawny cows are eaten by seven fat cows. And these seven scrawny um, uh, wheats are eaten by the, um, the, it's the other way around. The, the, the fat cows are eaten by the scrawny cows and the, the, the scrawny wheat eat the, the fat wheat. And so there was an interpretation that was given by Joseph that brought him out of the prison. And he says that there is going to be a famine, but seven years of plenty, and then there will be a famine. This is where we pick up the, the narrative. Genesis uh, chapter 41, verse 29. It says, seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. At that time, Egypt was like a, 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 a superpower, but they were going to be the the superpower of the world because of Joseph. 
but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land, and the abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. Look at his insight. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, meaning there's a confirmation here, and God will do it soon. There's an urgency. Now verse 33. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. So Joseph is giving the recommendation and the guidance to the king. He says, let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. So take a fifth, take 20% of the whole harvest and put it away. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked, can we find anyone like this man, Joseph? one in whom is the Spirit of God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Awesome. We're talking about stewardship here and how it has implications on the personal level, but also on the national level. And this is just but one example of how the people of God has all, have always been national blessings. Oh, yes. <laughs> national blessings. And the implications here are financial. This is the economy of the nation. And Egypt became a, a superpower as a result of this work that Joseph did. Because all the other nations started coming and bringing their wealth to Egypt in order to get food. And Egypt became wealthy because of one man, Joseph. My prayer is that you will be that man, that woman, in your company, in your nation. That corporately, there are ways, the wisdom of God to create wealth, the wisdom of God to open up abundance, that nations will not have to suffer in poverty, because there's a God in heaven who, is, who reveals solutions. But where are the children of God? Where are the men and women full of discretion and wisdom who are able to bring these solutions? It's you. It's you and I. No, Pastor Chris, I just want to you know, serve the Lord and, and go to be with the Lord. Yes, this is serving the Lord. This is serving the Lord, becoming everything that the Lord wants you to be so that you can be a blessing. Remember, it's more blessed to give than to receive, that you may be on the side of the givers instead of the side of the beggarly. So awesome. All right. And so this is the third principle that God wants you to change the world through you. God wants, God wants to change your environment, your community, your family through you. Number four, you will give an account and you will report to God. We're talking about having a mindset of stewardship. If you are a steward, it's because at the end, you will have to explain what you've done to someone else. Many times we live with our finances and our resources as if it's my money, it's my money. It is your money. It was given to you by the Lord. But it is your money to steward because there's no absolute owner except the Lord. And so we see here, let's look here at Luke chapter 10. This is a stewardship parable that we can get some principles from. And then we'll close. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 16. It says, uh, the first came before him. So there's this Lord that gave minas, or um, um, a mina is, is a, a, like a talent. It's a unit of, of, of finances, right? It's an economic unit, like currency. And so he gave money to these servants. And so um, he... He gave them with um, different amounts based on what they could handle. And, and so they're reporting back. The first came before him saying, Lord, 
your mina or your minor has made ten minors more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful over very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. Can you imagine? Look at the rulership. And this is pointing to the new creation, but also pointing to the, the principle of faithfulness in little. What you have done with the little, in multiplying that little, will make more to come. Let's continue. And, and the second came saying, Lord, your mina or your minor has made five minors. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. So the one that made 10 minors got 10 cities in terms of supervision. The one with five minors got five cities in terms of... Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, your minor, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. Look at his judgmental attitude of excuses. You take what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not so, and so the Lord said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, your wicked servant. Look at how the Lord looks at someone that is a terrible steward. He says you are wicked. Wicked. It is unacceptable to be wasteful. It is unacceptable not to be productive and not to produce according to what the Lord has placed in your hand. Why? Because you are a steward. If you were not a steward, this would not be applying to you. But you are a steward. This is why there's a day called Judgment Day, where men and women will answer for what they've done. He said, you wicked servant, you knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my, my coming, I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. <laughs> this is awesome. This parable really shows the, the, the fact that, look, give it, let's share it. And the Lord says, no, this is stewardship. This is not charity. Stewardship means give it to the best guy to produce the best. And this is a principle of wealth creation as well. If someone is not productive, get rid of them. Give it to someone. Promote the one who is productive, not the one who is not productive. Even that which, let's continue. They said to him, Lord, he has 10 minutes. And then he said in verse 26, I tell you that everyone who has already, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has, will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Okay, that's a bizarre ending there. But the principle is this, that faithfulness with little, good stewardship with what you have, produces promotion, produces more wealth, produces increase. This is a kingdom principle. And so the question is not, Lord, give me more. No. What have you done with what you have? Yes. What kind of stewardship have you exercised? Have you been generous with what you have? Have you been productive with what you have? Have you realized that you are a king and a priest, that you should use your wealth, the family's wealth, in order to produce, and you are custodian of the wealth of the kingdom of God, more than is in your bank accounts and in your pockets? Some of you, you should have prayed about finances. You should have been at a different place, but you just allowed things to go as they went. Some of you, there are family members that are in certain situations now that you should have bailed them out from. <laughs> but today I've got good news for us. Hallelujah. The truth is this, that if we are willing to repent, begin to realize who we are, that God has given us dominion and stewardship and management, that we are royalty, that as a royal family, we have custody of God's wealth, hallelujah, that we have riches in heavenly places that we are tapping in order to exercise the, the mandate of the kingdom, that God has called us to change people's lives, personally and nationally, corporately, wherever we go, we are change agents, we are ambassadors, hallelujah, we are catalysts for blessing, 
It is more blessed to give than to receive. We are like God. We love to be on the giver's side because that's the royal family's heart. And that will be reminded that we'll give an account for our wealth and for everything that we have. And we pray that today God will give us the wisdom of Joseph, that he'll give us the wisdom that is in Christ so that we may live this out. I want to pray for you right now. Um, there are people out there you're struggling financially and this message is really convicting your heart. And there are also people out there you, you're just happy that you're doing well for yourself. Every extra you get, every bonus you get, you pocket it, you eat it up. And God is saying you need to change your mentality today into a stewardship mentality and begin to enter into destiny altering transactions. Hallelujah. That will change the destiny of families and nations and your own destiny as well. Father, I pray for your people right now. Open their eyes, Lord, that they may see, that they may know who they are, and that they may begin to live the life that you've called them to live in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're out there and you're not born again, I want to pray for you right now. You are not a child of the King. You are out there lost without God, without hope in this world. You are an orphan without Christ. You might be church attending. You must be born again. It's not enough to just attend church. You must become a new person. You must be, you can't become a member of a royal family by membership. No, you must be born into a royal family or marry in. And in Christ, we are married to Christ. We are the bride of Christ and we are born of God. And in two ways, we have become members of the royal family. I want to pray for you. You want to give your life to Christ. You want to receive Jesus. You want to be welcomed into the family of God. Pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. Just as I am, I know that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins and I believe and I'm trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus that he died for me on the cross. He suffered in my place and in three days he was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, you are alive. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my savior. Be my master, be my brother, be my father. Today, I receive eternal life into my spirit. I receive the forgiveness of sins. I receive my relationship with God. I'm reconciled with the Father. I'm born again. I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer from the heart, the Bible says, with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. With a heart you believe and are justified. We believe that you have received Christ. Please send us a message in the comments or send us a message in all the, the contact details that you see in this video and we'll send you material and we'll invite you to grow spiritually in the things of God. Otherwise, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May you continue to experience the blessedness of God. May you grow in this revelation and begin to see the fruit and the impact of the love of Christ in your life and in your family. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Thank you for listening. For any additional information, please visit our website on ianvintuk.org.